Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos is at war with the National Enquirer and its parent company, AMI. Yeah, Bezos laid out this explosive allegation in a post on the blog site Medium last night. In it, Bezos says the tabloid's owner, David Pecker, was trying to blackmail him. In the post, he writes, quote, rather than capitulate to extortion and blackmail, I've decided to publish exactly what they sent me, despite the personal cost and embarrassment they threatened. Now, Bezos says the company was threatening to release intimate photos of him in an effort to stop him from finding out how the National Enquirer had obtained his private photos and text messages documenting an extramarital affair. Bezos also implies here that the reason for the blackmail is that he is the owner of the Washington Post, which has been dogged in its reporting about President Trump. So much to talk about here. NPR's Uri Berliner is here to help us understand this story. Hi, Uri. Hey, Rachel. So David mentioned there uh, some intimate photos uh, revealing an extramarital affair. Can you tell us more about what exactly the National Enquirer had on Bezos? Yeah, they said they had a series of photographs of Bezos and Lauren Sanchez, the woman that he had been having an affair with. Um, uh, very sexually suggestive, lewd photographs uh, that they were threatening to publish unless Bezos backed off from his, his investigation into how AMI, the parent company of the National Enquirer, obtained those photographs. And uh, that's he really wanted to find out how those uh, personal texts and photos were leaked. Right. So in this long medium post, uh, Bezos just publishes some of the emails that he says are from AM, AMI. What do they say? Yeah, so Bezos, you know, basically says, "Okay, you've got these photos on me. I've got these emails from you, from from officials from AMI, and basically they're saying uh, that they want Bezos to stop investigating. One of them from uh, uh, an AMI official uh, proposes some terms to end the dispute with Bezos. It, it says uh, it will agree not to publish any of the texts." Or photos, but in exchange, Bezos must say that AMI's coverage of his affair was not politically motivated. Hmm. The other email describes some of those uh, suggestive photos that we've been talking about. Um, I reached out to AMI for comment. I've not heard back from them, but Bezos in his post says there's a political motivation here. I mean, let's just spend a second talking about that. There are all kinds of political threads to this, right? As we noted, like David Pecker is a good friend of Donald Trump's, uh, and and Jeff Bezos is the owner of the Washington. Post, a paper that has been pretty critical and and aggressive in the reporting over over Donald Trump, right? Absolutely, uh, the Post has been very aggressive in its reporting of Trump. Um, Trump is also feuded with Amazon, the company that uh, Jeff Bezos founded. He claims they get all kinds of breaks; uh, they're not paying their fair share of taxes. So this has been an ongoing feud between uh, between President Trump and. Uh, and Bezos, who uh, owns the Post and founded Amazon. And remind us about the National Enquirer's connection to uh, the investigations into Donald Trump, because David Pecker was granted an immunity in the investigation into Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, uh, because Pecker was involved into those illicit payments uh, to Karen McDougal, right? Right. Uh, the National Enquirer acknowledged, acknowledged paying hush money to a former Playboy model uh, who said she had an affair with Trump. She was paid 150000 during the 2016 campaign. Uh, and so that's that's really what, what happened there. Um, he also refers to his ownership of the Post as being a complexifier for him, which is an odd word. Um, but, I mean, what more does he say about his role as the owner of the Post? He says, yeah, it's a complex fire, difficult, but he has no regrets about owning the Post. And it's, he says it's when he looks back on his life, owning the Post and supporting its mission is something he'll remain proud of uh, at age 90. Okay, and Pierre Zuri Brunner for us. Thanks, Zuri. You're welcome. The U.S. Supreme Court has blocked the state of Louisiana from implementing a restrictive new abortion law before then ruling on its constitutionality. Yeah, so this ruling right now puts a temporary stay on the law, which means clinics that perform abortions can keep operating for the time being until the court does rule on the constitutionality. Supreme Court reporter Amy Howe was with us to talk through the ruling and the dissent because there was some. Uh, Amy, thanks for being here. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. First, before we talk about the implications, what exactly would this law do in Louisiana? A lot of it depends on on uh, exactly how it plays out, and that is part of 
just as Brett Kavanaugh's dissent, which we can talk about. But the opponents of the law say that if the law is allowed to go into effect, there'd only be one doctor to provide abortions in the early stages of pregnancy and none at all for women seeking abortions uh, after 17 weeks of pregnancy. Hmm. Um, You mentioned Justice Kavanaugh's dissent. What did he say? So he was the only one who wrote to explain why he would have denied the stay that the opponents of the law were seeking. He would have allowed the law to go into effect. There were four justices altogether, Justices Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, and Neil Gorsuch, in addition to Kavanaugh, all said they would deny the stay and allow the law to go into effect. Um, But what Justice Brett Kavanaugh, the court's newest justice, wrote is that a central legal question in the case is whether this requirement that doctors who perform abortions in Louisiana have to have admitting privileges will will impose an undue burden, which is the legal standard for whether uh, a law violates the Constitution on a woman's right to have an abortion, um, um, depends on a factual question, whether the doctors in this case can actually get admitting privileges, and that's disputed. The district court, in this case, the trial court, said that they wouldn't be able to, and the Court of Appeals said that they would be able to. And so what Justice Kavanaugh said is, instead of putting the law on hold and speculating about this, let's figure it out during the 45-day transition period, because if the doctors can get admitting privileges, there's no undue burden and the law should be allowed to stand. If they can't, he said, they can come back to court, and this would be faster than doing doing it the way the court's going to do it, which ultimately probably will wind up with a decision sometime in the summer of 2020. Oh, interesting. Uh, let me yeah. ask you about how it broke, though. Five to four, John Roberts, the chief justice, sided with the liberals. Was that surprising? Uh, it was, uh, yes. Um, to, the, to be sure, the court was not writing on a blank slate because in 2016, the Supreme Court had struck down a similar law from Texas. But in that case, it was a uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy, who joined the court's four more liberal justices, and and the Chief Justice John Roberts, actually in dissent. We don't know what his reasoning was to vote this uh, to vote with the four, four more liberal justices last night, um, but. We do know that he's an institutionalist. So even if he might believe that the law is constitutional in a vacuum, may perhaps this Texas case from three years ago says otherwise. Amy Howe reports on the Supreme Court for the SCOTUS blog. Amy, thanks for being here this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. The will he or won't he debate is over. Acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker goes before the House Judiciary Committee today. Yeah, House Democrats have been eager to press Whitaker on his interactions with President Trump and his oversight of special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation, even threatening to subpoena him if he didn't show up. Whether he'll answer their more sensitive questions about the investigation is, of course, another matter, but we'll find out. House Democrats are feeling emboldened with their new majority. This is House Oversight Chair Elijah Cummings on Wednesday at a hearing on strengthening X rules for the executive branch. The American people gave this Congress and this committee a mandate to restore our democracy and clean up our government. All right. For more on on how House Democrats are using their newfound power, we've got NPR congressional reporter Kelsey Snell in the studio. Good morning, Kelsey. Good morning. So first off, let's talk about uh, Matt Whitaker. The acting AG is going to go before the Judiciary Committee today. What are they going to ask him? Well, first of all, this happened after a week of kind of back and forth. Whitaker originally threatened not to show up because Democrats on the committee were essentially threatening to subpoena him. But he agreed to appear last night. And Democrats say they want to ask him specifically about the Russia investigation. They are going to ask lots of questions. They're probably going to touch on things like the child separation policy or potentially um, about immigration and health care. But this will be largely about the Russian investigation, how much people know about it and how much they in, inside of uh, the, the attorney general's office, how much they're talking to the president about that. And it'll be public. So we'll watch that happen. This hearing with Whitaker comes at the end of a week where Democrats started to follow through on campaign promises to investigate the president, to investigate his administration. One of those promises, Democrats have pledged to look into Trump's tax returns. Uh, Is that going to be part of this oversight push? It absolutely is. We just don't know how fast it's going to move. 
uh, just the other day, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said that she was all, uh, uh, wanting people to be cautious. She wants people to be careful about this because sensitive tax returns are a really serious thing. And releasing them quickly has a lot of potential implications and potential legal implications if the president des- decides not to comply. But, you know, it's important to think about this in the context of broader oversight that Democrats want to do. They are moving forward from the shutdown and they want to spend their time making sure that they make good on promises to investigate this president. And this week was all about that. Is Does that jeopardize their other agenda items? Because they're, they're not just about investigating the president, right? They say that it isn't. They want to do other things. They want to make uh, health care more affordable. They want to have conversations about climate change. But really, when you are, Democrats are the only controlling the House. They don't have power over the Senate or the White House. So it's hard to legislate. Doing these investigations allows them to put their stamp on everything, on guns, on child separation, like we talked about, and even on the environment. Uh, Meanwhile, I I can't let you go without asking about the border security talks, because there is this panel of lawmakers who are trying to come up with a border security agreement to avert yet another government shutdown. Are they making progress? We are told that things are looking good and that they are negotiating in good faith, but a deal is not in hand yet. And I've been told by some people privately that they think that they might need a little bit more time than just next week. So this could get extended if they can't get a deal in the next couple of days. The deadline's the 15th, right? The 15th. Okay. We'll be following NPR's Kelsey Snell for us this morning. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank you. How can President Trump get himself out of a corner? Uh, In Washington, uh, talks at securing a deal on border security, including the president's wall, fell apart. The acting White House chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, spoke to Fox News Sunday, and here's what he said about the possibility of another shutdown. They cannot sign everything they put in front of him. There'd be some things that simply we couldn't agree to. um, So that government shutdown is technically still on the table. We do not want it to come to that. um, But that option is still open to the president and will remain so. So where does that leave negotiations right now? NPR White House correspondent Tamara Keith is here. Hi there, Tamara. Good morning. Uh, I just want to note Mick Mulvaney did raise the prospect of a shutdown there, but he said it's technically still on the table, which I read to mean virtually not on the table. Um, what, what, if anything, are lawmakers coming up with? Well, it, what we hear is that the negotiations at the moment are stalled. This comes after last week they were saying they were making good progress and everybody was optimistic. Now those negotiations have hit a bump. Uh, the, the problem seems to be not just funding for the wall. Democrats are now saying they would fund some portion of the wall, but they hmm. want something in exchange for that. And they, they want to uh, limit funding uh, for uh, ICE detention beds. Uh, they uh, they object to the way uh, that the Trump administration is doing uh, deportation policy, and uh, they want to sort of control the way that is done by limiting the number of detention beds. In past negotiations, uh, back when the government was still shut down, the White House had ask, had actually been asking for more money, about $800 million more for detention beds. Uh, so this is a, a real standoff, uh, and it's a different one. It's about policy hmm. more than it is about money or, or about symbolism. Yeah. Uh, but but it's also still very emotional and talked about in moral terms. Well, let's remember ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And there is a movement among some Democrats to abolish ICE. It doesn't sound like that's where Democrats are, but they want to restrict its activities uh, to some degree. So you have a broader border security debate. Now, now, how is the president trying to influence this debate by showing up near the Texas border today? Well, the president is likely to do what the president has done in other addresses, including the State of the Union and two other addresses to the American people as this debate has gone on, which is to uh, talk about crime and uh, and paint immigrants, all immigrants as criminals, uh, all immigrants coming through the southern border. uh, And and so he is likely to do the thing that he has been doing. It's not clear whether it will be persuasive, but San Antonio, uh, not San Antonio, El Paso. El Paso. El Paso is an area where he says the wall has worked. Well, El Paso is also the home city of Beto O'Rourke, the former congressman who is thinking about a run for president and by no means is the only, is he the only Democrat who's moving in that direction. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, and uh, Beto is on something of a vision quest, but other people have really been running for president already. Cory Booker was in South Carolina this weekend. Kirsten Gillibrand was also there. Amy Klobuchar made an announcement on an island in the middle of the Mississippi River in Minnesota in the middle of a snowstorm. Yeah, uh, Elizabeth Warren made it official uh, with a big uh, speech in Massachusetts. It is still frozen and snowy, and the 2020 campaign is up and running. There are five women members of Congress already running for president, and it's not even March. So much for a political correspondent to do. Tamara, glad you're there. (laughs) Thank you. That's NPR's Tamara Keith. Just over a week ago, it was perfectly fair to ask, how could the governor of Virginia possibly keep his job? Ralph Northam is now trying to answer that very question. He refused to resign over an old racist photo and is now giving interviews in an effort to rebuild public support for him. He gave one interview to Gail King on CBS. Virginia needs someone that can heal. Uh, There's no better person to do that than a doctor. Virginia also needs someone who is strong, who has empathy, who has courage and who has a moral compass. And that's why I'm not going anywhere. Northam has denied that he was in the old yearbook photo. He admits he did wear blackface while impersonating Michael Jackson once. He's defending himself at the same time that the the lieutenant governor, rather, faces two accusations of sexual misconduct. And let's focus on the lieutenant governor, Justin Fairfax. Whitney Evans of our member station WCVE in Richmond has been covering that part of the story. Good morning. Good morning. So how has Fairfax's case advanced over the weekend? Well, first, to be... To be clear, Fairfax has strongly denied both of these allegations. He says the encounters in question were consensual. So what's happened since the first allegation is that people are now calling on Fairfax to step down. They weren't after the first allegation. Um, Lots of prominent people in Virginia and across the country are now saying they want to see him resign immediately. And uh, that includes most of Virginia's congressional delegation and even people like uh, uh, Senator Kamala Harris, who's running for president. Um, But there are also some people who are saying, slow this down. Let's not rush to judgment. Uh, There's some religious groups that have a rally scheduled at the Capitol today Hmm. um, to support keeping Fairfax in office. So other than denying the allegations, Fairfax is he's called for an FBI investigation to clear his name. But it's unclear if the FBI would take that up. It's usually um, uh, local jurisdictions that that handle these kinds of cases. I did see the video over the weekend of one Virginia lawmaker stepping before reporters and saying if the lieutenant governor doesn't resign by Monday, I'm going to start impeachment proceedings. Can he do that? Well, there is a a difference of opinion about whether impeachment uh, for this situation is even possible in Virginia. Um, A a state representative, a Democrat, his name's Patrick Hope, said he's going to start the impeachment process today and he plans to introduce a resolution in the House. And then if a majority of the House vote in favor of the resolution, the process begins. But it's ultimately up to the Senate, which will conduct a trial and and make the final call. Um, But I spent some time this weekend with uh, this man named Dick Howard. He's Mm -hmm. a a constitutional scholar in Virginia, and he was actually part of the group that rewrote the Virginia Constitution in 1971. He's the only one left of that group. He was uh, 35 years old when he helped write it, and he's in his early 80s now, and he had this to say. The Constitution actually says that you have impeachment if there has been malfeasance in office, uh, corruption, neglect of duty, or other high crime or misdemeanor. So Delegate Hope, the, uh, uh, the, the representative who uh, plans to introduce the articles of impeachment, he says sexual assault obviously is clearly, you know, a high crime. But Howard's interpretation is uh, interpretation of the Constitution is that the high crime or misdemeanor piece has to have taken place while the uh, official was in office. Hmm. Right. To qualify for impeachment, the crime has to be somehow tied to the elected official's position of power. And of course, these accusations are more than a decade old, well before he became lieutenant governor. So can he continue doing uh, the job, which is a real job, Lieutenant Governor? I mean, yes, he's being public today. Can he continue doing that? Yeah. And he and and he does. Uh, there's no there's no reason to believe that he wouldn't. Um, he he does uh, plan. Sources close to him say that he does plan to, to gavel in today and it will be business as usual. Gavel in because he, uh, he runs the Senate when you're the lieutenant governor of Virginia. That's right. He he runs the Senate and he is uh, next in line. Uh, should the governor, uh, the, the office of the governor go vacant. Whitney, thanks so much. Thank you. That's Whitney Evans uh, of WCVE. All right. The confrontation in Venezuela. 
now moves to that country's border. Yeah, the border uh, between Venezuela and Colombia. What you're hearing now is the sound of Venezuelan doctors. Uh, Yesterday, they were near this bridge that connects Colombia and Venezuela, and they are demanding that the Venezuelan military stop the blockade that is now keeping U.S. humanitarian aid from getting into the country. And of course, the backdrop to all this is the political crisis in Venezuela between the president, Nicolas Maduro, and the U.S.-backed opposition leader, Juan Guaido. Which the U.S. is now, who the U.S. is now re- recognized as the president. John Otis is covering this story from the Colombia-Venezuela border. Hi there, John. Hi, Steve. Um, what is the purpose of the United States in sending this aid? Well, uh, you know, on paper, the reason is because there's a big humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. Um, They're sending up, uh, you know, rice and beans and cooking oil and all kinds of, um, you know, emergency medical kits and baby formula. And, you know, they want to try to get that aid into Venezuela to start uh, to try to help alleviate all the suffering. Uh, But there's also a lot of politics involved. Um, One of the reasons for massing all this aid, you know, right on the border is to try to tempt the Venezuelan military forces or shame the Venezuelan military forces who are propping up Maduro. Uh, they want the the top officers to turn against his government to allow this aid to start flowing into the country to alleviate the suffering. And, you know, that would be one way to bring about uh, regime change, which is what the Trump administration and the opposition is really pushing. Oh, because the United States has effectively said this is humanitarian aid for the Venezuelan people in the name of the government we recognize, the government of Juan Guaido. Yes, that's exactly right. They're trying to give a boost to Guaido. Guaido really doesn't control anything in Venezuela, but they want to this uh, humanitarian aid to be kind of a symbol of the, the good things that Guaido would bring to Venezuela if he is actually allowed to rule and if uh, Maduro goes into exile. Well, note, John, that you're in a border city there. I imagine you've been down to see the border crossing. What, as far as you can tell from the Colombian side, is the attitude of the Venezuelan military up to now? You know, up to now, Steve, I mean, there have been, uh, you know, just a few defections um, uh, and also the top, uh, you know, military attache in Washington has turned against um, Maduro. But overall, uh, the Venezuelan military is standing firm. They're supporting Maduro. And so the problem here is that uh, because of that, you know, Maduro is still in power. He still controls the country. And there's really kind of no plan B for getting this aid across the border Uh, into Venezuela. Okay. Thanks for the update, John. Really appreciate it. No problem. That is reporter John Otis speaking to us from the Colombia-Venezuela border. They were under a whole lot of pressure to make it happen, and now Congress says they have a deal to prevent another government shutdown. Key lawmakers agreed on a range of border security measures, and those measures include President Trump's demand to fund a border wall, which led to a partial government shutdown. Before the shutdown, Democrats offered the president $1.3 billion for that wall. After the shutdown, Republicans have apparently agreed to roughly the same amount that they could have had before. At least according to early descriptions of the bill, it falls billions short of what the president demanded. As the deal came together, the president was holding a campaign-style rally near the border in El Paso, Texas. Just so you know, we're building the wall anyway. They say that progress has been made with this bill. Just now, just now. I said, wait a minute, I got to take care of my people from Texas. I got to go. I don't even want to hear about it. NBR White House correspondent Scott Horsley was traveling with the president to Texas, and he is on the line, along with NPR congressional reporter Kelsey Snell. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Kelsey, I want to start with you uh, because you are covering the ins and outs of what this compromise is actually about. So what can you tell us in terms of the details here? Well, the details that we have are kind of early information from congressional aides who have reviewed the agreement. We have not actually seen the physical bill yet because they were working on it all through the night. 
From what we understand, negotiators agreed to $1.375 billion for physical barriers at the border. And we're, I'm told that's fencing, including some new fencing in restricted areas. Now, that level is about the same as what was agreed to in last year's Department of Homeland Security funding bill. Right. Now, that would fund about 55 miles of fencing. And Trump has been demanding $5.7 billion for a really much larger wall structure. Uh, so this this is a, considerably less than what they were asking for. They also agreed to more resources for non-barrier border security and a reduction in the overall number of detention beds at immigration and customs enforcement facilities this year. So that's we're a win for Democrats because yeah, they've been pushing Yeah, definitely. That. It's on the order of 40,000 beds, and that's like a 17 percent drop. Hmm. Um, do we know if there's any other money allocated to border security other than that $1.3 billion? Because that had been in the offing, right? Additional resources for like humanitarian aid or something. Right. And like you said, that the number of ICE detention beds is a big victory for Democrats or that they are they're framing it that way. Um, but there would be an additional one point seven billion dollars for border security. Things like technology at ports of entry, more offer uh, officers at the border and a lot of other things that um, ICE and the Department of Homeland Security have said that they needed. Now, that is a boost. And that's something that Republicans are likely to be celebrating quite a bit. That was something that both parties at least said in theory right. that they wanted all those things. Um, so what is not in the deal that stands out? I think the thing that stands out most to me is that the negotiators told us as they were coming out of the meeting, they weren't able to include any money for disaster aid. And Congress will still have to handle that. It's something they had hoped to have as a part of this broader package because there are states like California that dealt with a lot of uh, wildfires and other natural disasters last year, and they're still hoping for federal funds to help them make up the difference. Okay, so at this point, the big question is and remains, will President Trump support this? Because as we have pointed out, this is basically what was put on the table for him before the shutdown even happened. Uh, Scott, you were with the president at this rally in El Paso. We played a clip of him earlier. What what more did he say about this deal? Because he, he knew, right, as the rally was starting, he, he knew about the, at least the contours of this compromise. He was, he was just getting word. I mean, it's an awkward position for the president. He goes to El Paso to make the case for his border wall. And just as he's landing, he gets word that lawmakers have really cut the legs out from under him uh, because they're only okaying about a quarter of the money he'd been asking for. As you heard, uh, he just kind of ignored what was happening in Washington, plowed ahead and addressed the, uh, the desires of the f- fervent supporters who were in that coliseum. Um, during the rally, we should just point out, he, he brought up a new chant, a new call and response. Usually it's build the wall. Uh, but there was a lot of, quote, finish the wall banner and signs. Um, and this is how the president responded when people start saying build the wall. Let's listen. You really mean finish that wall because we built a lot of us. Finish that, wall. that makes it sound like the wall is well underway. Uh, can you give us some ground truth on that? Well, you want uh, real reality or Trump reality? Real actually, reality. Because remember, th- this is a this is a president who, as a developer, had no problem inflating the height of its buildings, if his buildings, if that's what it took to you know improve the marketing picture. Uh, if, even if Trump had gotten all the money he wanted, uh, we would have been talking about walling off maybe 10 percent of the 2,000 mile border. As it is, as Kelsey says, he's going to get 55 miles of border wall. The president's a pretty effective salesman. Maybe he can sell this to the wall's most ardent supporters. And remember, most of them don't live anywhere near the U.S. border with Mexico. Hmm. It's striking to hear the difference, Scott and Kelsey, between what you're hearing in Washington and what you're hearing in El Paso. The president is going on with symbolic politics and symbolic gestures and discussions of a wall that really, for a lot of people, was a symbol. But Kelsey, when I hear you describe the legislation as far as it's known now, it sounds like just ordinary legislation, lawmakers going through a variety of measures that may have effect on people's lives, and they differ on the exact amount of funding, so they worked that out and went on. Yeah, I mean, this is, at the end of the day, an agreement on a spending package, on a spending bill that they had to pass anyway. And the <laughs> right. people who worked it out are the people who write spending bills. This is not this is a bipartisan group of the biggest experts in Congress in writing spending bills. And to them, that's what this is. What happens now, Kelsey? I mean, because it, this isn't just all of a sudden done. I mean, even even if they have this compromise. Right. Congress has to approve the legislation and send it to President Trump for his signature before the Friday midnight deadline. And Trump would presumably need time to sign it. Senator Richard Shelby, who is the chairman of the Appropriations Committee in the Senate, seemed pretty optimistic that the White House is on board. Here's what he said. 
We hadn't put all the particulars together yet, but we believe from our dealings with him and the latitude they've given us, they will support it. We certainly hope so. So he Hope says that springs they... <laughs> eternal, Kelsey, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, and they say that they'll have the bill probably ready sometime today, and Congress can move pretty quickly once they have bill text in hand. And, of course, they had a lot of hopes the last time when the president <laughs> decided at the last minute not to sign it. NPR's Kelsey Snell and NPR's Scott Horsley for us this morning. Thanks, you guys. You're Thank welcome. you. This week marks one year since the Parkland Massacre a year that turned many of the survivors of that shooting into political activists calling for tighter gun control. They have an unlikely partner in Ed Stack. He is CEO of Dick's Sporting Goods, a company that sells firearms, among many other things. After the tragedy in Parkland, he said Dick's would no longer sell firearms to anyone under 21. Here he is on CNN. Everybody talks about thoughts and prayers going out to them, and that's great. But that doesn't really do anything, and we felt that we needed to take a stand and do this. The sporting goods store also stopped selling assault-style firearms at all in all of its stores. Our Alina Seljuk has been reporting on the aftermath of Stack's decision. And she's in our studios this morning. Good morning, Alina. Good morning. What has Ed Stack said about how he came to this decision these many months ago? He talks about the profound impact that Parkland had on him and his company. Um, In one of the most personal interviews in November, he mentions that he watched the coverage that weekend and actually cried. Um, He says that, you know, the kids and the families of the victims were brave enough to take a stand on this. We as a company should also be brave enough to take a stand on this. And uh, also, Dick's had discovered that months earlier they had sold a gun to the Parkland shooter. Now, this wasn't a gun that was used in the shooting. It was a different type of gun. But Mm -hmm. to Ed Stack, this illustrated this broken system that he now wanted Congress to change. And, you know, Dick Sporting Goods, the reason we've been following the story is it's not a company that's known to go out on a limb. Uh, An example I like to offer is their dress code didn't allow jeans officially until two years ago, right? And so suddenly, for many Americans, this was now the staid, dependable athletic store essentially plunging into activism. And they made those changes that you just mentioned. um, And most controversially, they also hired a lobbying firm to actually lobby Congress for for gun uh, laws, for new gun laws that would echo Dick's policy. Um, I have to say that the latest records show that the company spent barely any money on that effort. I asked them about it, and they essentially said, faced with gridlock in Washington, they um, uh, Stack himself felt like there was no progress out of that, and he instead shifted to talking about gun laws and the changes he made on his company at events yeah. and things like that. How did Duck Dick's customers respond? Uh, to this decision. Right. There was a big boycott that played out in the first months. And I actually traveled to Pittsburgh, which is where our Dick Sporting Goods is based, to talk to folks there. And uh, a lot of gun owners, especially in the suburbs of in sort of western Pennsylvania, where hunting and, and uh, gun sports are really popular, they did say that they stopped shopping at the company. Um, others the, in the more liberal parts of the city felt really p- uh, proud of the company. But there was this one big perception that This whole thing was a knee-jerk reaction to Parkland, and it was a profound change, but it's important to point out that after the shooting at Sandy Hook in 2012, Dix did make a similar change. They took off assault-style rifles from the shelves and later brought them back only in this hunting-oriented stores uh, called Field and Stream, which now are also, uh, they're not being sold there uh, anymore. So this has been kind of percolating for quite some time. So does that mean that that he, that Stack was acting against his own financial interests when he made this decision? I mean, what has been the financial fallout Mm -hmm. for the company? So this has been the interesting question. Wall Street was actually really not that moved by this whole story. Um, In November, the company did report a dip in sales, 3.9%, especially dragged down by hunting. But profit margin improved because what Wall Street knows is that guns and ammo were actually not as profitable for Dick's Sporting Goods as pretty much everything else that they sell. Hmm. Um, And hunting has been a drag on the company for quite some time. Fewer people are hunting these days. They're actually running a test, taking out hunting goods from 10 stores completely to see what happens. And in March, they will report full year results and we'll be watching. All right. NPR's Alina Seljuk for us. Thank you so much for that, Alina. We appreciate it. Thank you. Donald Trump, the president of the United States, has never been one to hold back when he doesn't like something. 
Am I happy at first glance? I just got to see it. The answer is no, I'm not. I'm not happy. That was the president speaking there to reporters just as details were getting out about a bipartisan border security deal. This legislation includes some spending for border fencing, but it falls billions of dollars short of the money that President Trump had demanded for a border wall. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is urging the president to support this bill. When last we spoke of the border deal, the public had not yet seen the bill. So what does this agreement really do for border security? Let's ask NPR's Scott Horsley, who's on the line. Scott, good morning. Good morning, Steve. Let's begin with one thing we do know for sure. Nita Lowy, one of the negotiators, affirmed it last night on All Things Considered. Frankly, it denies the president billions of dollars in funding for the concrete wall that he demanded. Okay, the billions are missing. So if the bill doesn't have that, Scott Horsley, is there anything for the president to hold on to and claim that his side won? Well, there are a few bones for the president, to be sure. Um, we still haven't seen the actual bill, so we will get more information as this day goes on. But we do know, as you mentioned, it includes only about a quarter of the wall funding that the president had demanded, only enough to build about 55 miles of advanced fencing. Uh, it also does not include the increased funding for detention beds that the president had sought to house people who are awaiting deportation. Mm -hmm. In fact, the authorized number of beds uh, in this agreement is down from the number that Homeland Security is housing right now. However, we don't believe it includes the sharp reduction in beds for people who are arrested in the interior of the United States that some on the Democratic side had been seeking. So what? I guess you could call that a a win for the president. Okay. Uh, and and also uh, there is some additional money for uh, enhanced uh, border security that doesn't involve a wall. Well, let's get to the practical effect here on the border, setting aside the politics for, for the moment. Is it becoming clear uh, how this measure, this package of measures, would make the border more secure? Well, certainly a lot of this discussion has been largely symbolic. Whether we're talking about 55 miles of wall or 200 plus miles that the president had been seeking, it, it's all a fraction of the 2,000 mile border. Mm -hmm. This does include uh, additional money to beef up the official ports of entry. And it's important to remember, Steve, uh, that there is a huge amount of legitimate cross-border traffic that sometimes gets lost as we talk about illicit traffic. Uh, that's enormously important in places like El Paso, like McAllen, like San Diego. There is also, however, non-human traffic, and a lot of the fencing that is in this uh, bill is in the Rio Grande Valley, an environmentally sensitive area, and that could be affected adversely by the wall that is included. Okay. All right, Scott, thanks for the update. Really appreciate it. You're very welcome. That's NPR Scott Horsley. Many of the stories in the news today touch on U.S. relations with Latin America. That is certainly true of the American jury that convicted the Mexican drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. Yeah, that verdict was handed down in a federal courthouse in Brooklyn on Tuesday. U.S. Attorney Richard Donahue spoke outside the courthouse uh, after the verdict was read. This conviction, we expect, will bring a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. It is a sentence from which there is no escape and no return. The jury's decision came after weeks of gripping, at times even disturbing testimony. A number of former cartel members actually took the stand and then detailed the brutality and bloodshed that was at the core of El Chapo's cartel. A cartel was responsible for a lot of the flow of narcotics into the U.S. for decades. So the question now, how is this conviction being viewed back in Mexico? Well, NPR's Carrie Khan is going to tell us because she is in Mexico City. Hi, Carrie. Hi, good morning. Is this a big subject of conversation where you are? Well, it's been covered in the press here. Um, definitely isn't dominating the news, but, you know, some of the trial's more salacious revelations got some good media play. Remember the day in the trial when this uh, convicted Colombian trafficker testified for the prosecution that Guzman had paid the former president a $100 million bribe? Hmm. Yeah, that, that barely got coverage here. I think part of it was that Mexicans were in the midst of a crippling gas crisis. But also, I think there's a lot of corruption fatigue since, you know, these past years have been plagued by revelation after revelation of high-level corruption and conflict of interest scandals by the previous administration. But yesterday, we went out after the verdict, and we did get reaction from Mexicans here in the, in the Capitol. And by far, most were pleased with Guzman's conviction. One high school student said, you know, maybe in some parts of the country, Guzman 
to still seen it romanticized for his outlaw persona, but for him, he was a brutal criminal who caused this country so much pain. And this one 30-year-old computer salesman really summed up what a lot of different people said, is that how Mexico could and should have been the one to try Guzman. And they just felt bad that it's unfortunate that a foreign government had to bring this man to justice once Car- and for all. Carrie, I'm curious, uh, when you talk about the relatively muted coverage in the media, I have heard over the years, perhaps you have as well, of Mexican journalists who are threatened, who are killed, editors who are told not to put certain things in the paper. Is this something that if you're in the Mexican media, you have to be a little bit careful about what you say, even though obviously Guzman is in federal custody now? Definitely. Definitely. Um, there is a lot of self-censorship here by the press, and but there are also a lot of courageous and brave journalists that try and cover this drug uh, war and the cartels as best as they can. But it is, you know, Mexico has one of the highest rates of journalists being murdered in the world. Do you have a sense as to whether Guzman's conviction will significantly affect the actual flow of drugs into, through, out of Mexico into the United States? Well, just looking at Guzman's cartel specifically, the Sinaloa cartel, it hasn't lost much strength since his arrest in 2016 or his extradition in 2017. It's still one of the largest in the world, and that's according to the U.S. and the DEA's, the Drug Enforcement Administration's uh, Last year, their drug threat assessment, they said in it that the cartel maintains the most expansive international footprint of any Mexican drug organization still. Wow. Okay. Kerry, thanks for the update. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. That's NPR's Kerry Khan in Mexico City. Okay, a thousands of migrant children continue to arrive at the U.S.-Mexico border every month without their parents. Right, and then many of these kids are then transferred to an emergency intake shelter in South Florida. It's called Homestead, and it's been the focus of a lot of controversy. It is the largest shelter for migrant children in the U.S., and it's the only one run by a for-profit corporation, and there's no oversight from state regulators. NPR's John Burnett toured the shelter. He's with us this morning. Hi, John. Hey, Steve. So what did you see when you got in there? Well, really, it's, you know, the tour guide tried to make it seem like it was a summer camp to us. Um, This was actually my third tour of a large government child shelter, and there was certain similarities among all of them. They show you the soccer fields and the basketball courts and classrooms and the Xbox games and the cafeteria where they get three hot meals and two snacks a day. And they tell us about the holiday parties and the talent shows. And then you see the kids, these lines of 12 Central American teenagers at a time. They're all walking very orderly, single file, escorted by a youth worker. They smile and say, hola. But the thing is, you never really get to talk to the children or record anything. So that leaves you going for other sources of information as well you should. Uh, are there people who have spoken with the children that can give you information? Right. And this was really interesting. I had the good fortune to get a fuller picture of the lives of these migrant kids uh, in the homestead shelter. I sat down with a group of attorneys who've been granted access to the children by a federal judge. They oversee the welfare of migrant kids in U.S. custody. And I asked them, okay, so this is what reporters see on our sort of stage-managed tours. What do you, the lawyers, see? This is Leisha Welch. She's director of legal advocacy at the National Center for Youth Law. We see a very different picture we see extremely traumatized children, some of whom sit across from us and can't stop crying over what they're experiencing. So Welch described uh, what she said was well-meaning policies gone horribly awry. She told me about adolescents who've been traumatized in their home country and then by the grueling journey north, and now they're forbidden to touch each other, even if they're siblings, even if they've made close friends to the shelter and one gets transferred and they can't hug that person goodbye. Um, The shelter says the no-touch rules are there to protect the children. Why is it significant to note that this is a for-profit detention facility or it's being run in any case by a for-profit company? So, you know, I've, I've reported about private companies that run immigrant detention facilities for ICE a lot over the years, but I had no idea that private industry was moving into child shelters. There's a Florida company called Comprehensive Health Services that runs Homestead, which now has 1,600 kids. The government pays um, CHS about $1.2 $1.2 million a day to care for these kids. Hmm. The company says uh, that the children, that there's, there's, uh, their safety and welfare is their top priority, and they follow all federal regulations to the letter. 
but there's definitely good money to be made here. I also found out that just in the last two weeks, this company had taken in over three, rather this this company has taken over three additional shelters in South Texas um, for a, a total of 500 additional uh, migrant youngsters. So when you call up this company and you say, you know, I can see you're making a profit here, and I've also spoken with lawyers for children you're holding, and they say they're traumatized, what's the company say to that? Well, they'll say... Um, uh, and the government will tell you that their mission is to get the custody of these kids out of the Border Patrol in these cage-like holding cells that have been so harshly criticized and actually get them into places like Homestead, uh, which are, you know, they're not summer camps, but they're a major improvement over the austere border cells. And, uh, of course, it's not the environment of a loving family, uh, but they have case managers at all the shelters who work to find sponsors um, that the kids can go live with. Um and immigrant advocates say that the kids still are staying too long at these shelters, 67 days. 67 days on average. On John, average, right. thanks for your reporting. Really appreciate it. You bet, Steve. That's NPR's John Burnett. Why, when he knew the consequences, did Paul Manafort lie? Well, that question remains after a judge ruled that Manafort did intentionally lie. He had a plea deal with the special counsel investigating Russia's involvement in U.S. politics. He was supposed to give truthful information. Robert Mueller says he did not. And the judge's agreement means his plea deal is done. Democrats have a theory as to why. Adam Schiff is chair of the House Intelligence Committee. It's not just that if he told the truth, it would be damaging to Manafort, but it would reflect so adversely on the president that he would lose his chance of a pardon. That is one theory. What can we learn from the nature of the lies? NPR justice correspondent Carrie Johnson is on the line once again. Carrie, good morning. Good morning, Steve. What exactly did Manafort lie about? Judge Amy Berman Jackson found that Paul Manafort lied about a payment to a law firm that apparently did some work for him, about some other unrelated criminal investigation, and then here's the most important thing. Judge Jackson and Manafort lied about the nature of his interactions with Konstantin Kalimnik, who the FBI has linked to Russian intelligence. They had meetings and conversations throughout the campaign, and even after the campaign, after the inauguration and into 2018, that prosecutors say were at the heart of this investigation into Russian election interference and whether any Americans helped. Okay, wow. Uh, So this is uh, Paul Manafort's conversations with a guy linked to Russian intelligence. I'm just making sure I understand this. And you're saying that Paul Manafort lied about talking with this person throughout the presidential campaign where Manafort was campaign chairman for President Trump for a while and even continued after the election for a good for for a good while. So are we able to learn anything from anything true from knowing which lies he told? Well, you know, a lot of the proceedings in this matter have been sealed. We're eventually getting transcripts, which have a lot of blacked out versions or redactions. We do know that prosecutors think that Manafort passed some kind of polling data to this uh, person, the FBI is linked to Russian intelligence, that they had a meeting in August 2016 at the heart of the campaign. And we also know this, Steve, that Rick Gates, who was Paul Manafort's right-hand man and deputy, has been cooperating for a lot longer than Paul Manafort. Prosecutors are taking this information from Richard Gates, who also was around the campaign, the inauguration, and the Trump White House, and contrasting it with what Manafort has told them to help determine that Manafort has lied about matters central to this investigation into what happened with the Russians and Americans in 20. Oh, because in order to know that Manafort lied, you would need to know uh, at least some of the truth. I don't want to connect these dots too firmly yet, Carrie, but I want to note what some of the dots are. You're saying that Manafort is suspected of passing polling information to Russians. That's one dot. We know that Russians using uh, Internet troll farms and other methods to pass propaganda messages to the United States during the election. Uh, what would it mean if those dots were more firmly connected? I think... We're- I think we're going to need to wait and see what Robert Mueller and the FBI investigators have found rather than speculate about what might be out there. There's been a lot of bad reporting in this case. We've got to be careful. But what we do know is those dots are there and that the Mueller investigation continues. That's, yes, that's right. Carrie, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. That's NPR's Carrie Johnson. It's been one year since the Parkland mass shooting in Florida where David uh, has been reporting this week. Yeah, that's right. This morning, uh, I'm in Broward County, Florida, Steve, just a a few miles or so from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, where that mass shooting claimed 17 lives a year ago. And since then, 
As we know, young Parkland survivors have really emerged as a driving force calling for stricter gun laws across the United States. Some of them have become quite prominent across the country. So how is the community marking this moment, David? I mean, I, I think when you can, one thing you can say is this is not going to be a normal day here. They've made attendance not mandatory at the high school. And you hear from many parents who are saying they're not going to have their kids go to school. They're going to have them close with them at home to spend the day. Um, at 10, 17 a.m., there's going to be a moment of silence planned to honor the 17 people killed a year ago. And many schools across the state of Florida are expected to join in that. And there's a commemoration tonight in a park that's just a few blocks from the school, and that's the same spot where a vigil took place a year ago and and 17 crosses were put up. We've been uh, following your reporting and the reporting of an NPR team on social media, David, and seeing these really quite memorable photographs of of young people in the sunshine in Florida reflecting on this, this event. What are you hearing? Yeah, I mean, you know, for one thing, if you remember the youth movement that that was really born from the tragedy to to combat gun violence and spoke to one of the leaders of that movement, David Hogg, Um, he's now graduated from the school. He's moving on to Harvard. He says he's excited about college, but, you know, he's sounding as determined as ever to keep the fight on, even as he is spending more time in in New England than than down here. And, you know, we talked to a theater director, Steve, who's trying to create a space for students to come and and create theater and art and have a place to kind of let steam off. And I also spoke to a young man, Patrick Petty. He lost his his sister, Elena, in the shooting. And he was remembering um, how he and his sister used to go to the shooting range together. That's something that uh, my sister and I bonded over and uh, something that we both enjoyed doing. And I can remember seeing the uh, the smile on her face the first time she went shooting and the first time she was learning. She really enjoyed it. And so, you know, I asked Patrick if his views have changed about guns since his sister was killed in a shooting. And he said no. He believes in the Second Amendment as strongly as ever, including the right to own assault weapons like the one that was used in the shooting where his sister was killed. But he said he has become a little more open to listening to people on the other side of the gun debate, is more open to conversation, which was interesting. Yeah. Uh, David, there's a bit of news I want to ask about. The governor of Florida, if I have this correctly, has asked for a grand jury investigation in response to demands for accountability, specifically uh, holding accountable the county superintendent of schools in Broward County. Haven't you spoken with him? I have. Yeah. Robert Runcie, um, the superintendent here, has been under a lot of criticism. And, and the new governor, Ron DeSantis, called for this grand jury to investigate school security across the state, but especially here in Broward County. There's been so much anger, Steve, among uh, among the families of Parkland victims who, who don't think that uh, the superintendent reached out to them enough over the past year. They don't think he's moved quickly enough to put new security measures in place. When I sat down with Runcie, I mean, he told me that you can't rush security measures just because it's in response to a tragedy, that they have to be carefully thought out. And he also took a moment to apologize to families who don't think that he has been there for them. Mm. Well, David, thanks for being there for us. Uh, We are listening to your coverage on NPR News from Parkland this week. Some other news now. How much damage... Did a former U.S. Air Force officer do to national security? Yeah, Monica Witt, she defected to Iran back in 2013. And now the former U.S. Air Force counterintelligence officer is being accused of providing secrets to the Tehran government. There's a federal indictment that says she disclosed the code name and the secret mission of a Pentagon program for hackers linked to the Iranian government have now also been charged. And they allegedly tried to install spy software on computers that belong to Witt's colleagues. All of this allegedly happened years ago, but we're just learning about it now. And NPR's Peter Kenyon is covering the story. Uh, Peter tracks Iran for us. Hi, Peter. Hi, Steve. What exactly was Witt working on when she was with the Air Force? Well, she started in 97. Uh, She worked there until 2008. The indictment does not give the exact nature of what she was working on, but uh, she did learn Farsi early on. Uh, She joined then the Office for Special Investigation. That's counterintelligence. Uh, The indictment says Witt came to the FBI's attention uh, after she traveled to Iran and appeared in a video criticizing the U.S. Hmm. Uh, 
she told the agents, I'm not going to divulge any sensitive information, don't worry. And she passed uh, a series of U.S. security and background checks. Uh, but the indictment says she began working with a so-called talent spotter for Iranian intelligence. Uh, then in 2013, she told her story at the Iranian embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan. And then in late August of that year, she flew to Tehran. You used the word counterintelligence, which generally speaking means Americans who are trying to uh, trying to fight back on at Iranian efforts to penetrate the United States. And instead, yep. uh, she became a penetration in a way. What kind of information did she provide Iran? Uh, yeah, it's a good point. The indictment doesn't give out a lot of specifics, but it mentions a Pentagon special access program. That means classified information that she had access to, uh, along with the code names uh, for that program. Uh, Monica Witt also knew the identities of several U.S. intelligence agents, and she knew the real names of some intelligence sources. Uh, the indictment lists eight agents uh, or analysts known to have worked or interacted with Witt, uh, and it says Witt created target packages for Iran to use against against U.S. agents. Uh, the counts against her include passing national defense information to a foreign government, cyber offenses, identity theft, and as you mentioned, there's four Iranian cyber attackers also named. Is there any response from this person who defected to Iran years ago or from Iran itself? Not so far. Uh, in going through Iranian media, though, I did find a story from about a couple of weeks ago uh, by the Fars News Agency. It's seen as close to Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps. And that story is headlined, The Story of an American Soldier Whose Dreams Came True in Iran. Uh, and it quotes Witt making disparaging remarks about the U.S. military uh, and also saying that her 2012 conversion to Islam was a dream come true. Wow. Uh, very briefly, Peter, are Iranians feeling very much pressure from the increasing U.S. effort to isolate them after dropping out of a nuclear deal? If so, they're not uh, saying so. There is a meeting going on in Warsaw, billed as an anti-Iran meeting. It's been had the title changed. Secretary Pompeo says the most important thing for stability in the Mideast is to confront Iran. Okay. Peter, thanks very much for the up. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. That's NPR's Peter Kenyon.